Welcome to episode 58. This is another thing I, I think athletes get and uh, non-athletes don't quite understand is that you're always going to be uncomfortable, but it's actually, it's microseconds. In fact, one of the things we know from flow, flow is a cycle and on the front end is a struggle phase and it's an, it's an overload. You might be smarter, your daddy might own a company, but you will not outwork me. This one right here is for the people. In this safe shot city. Don't stop, no, don't quit. Yeah. You know who this kid is, he's from Chicago. I'm your host, Ryan J. Owens, current pro athlete, entrepreneur, and former USA national team volleyball player. I will not be defined by my athleticism alone, but, I've learned how to leverage it, to stay passionate about it, and prepare for life. That's why the Beyond Athletic Podcast was born. I'll bring you case studies of current and former elite athletes making it happen in life, as well as tips and lessons from top sources in sports, nutrition, fitness, entrepreneurship, and more. I'm here to tell you that you are Beyond Athletic. Welcome back. If you've heard previous episodes, if you're a first time listener, thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed it. If you think of somebody when you hear this, as always, share it with them. Help somebody out. Post it online if you want to go above and beyond. We love it. Also, you can always leave us a review and uh, we'll use that, whether it's guest recommendations or things you liked or would like to see on the show. We appreciate it. This episode's guest, very excited, Stephen Kotler author of The Rise of Superman. It was a really nice chat with him, basically getting into how our mind is the thing that we can control 100%. And we really rarely tap into that. And when we do tap into it, either by mistake or on purpose, how can we replicate some of those things, especially like this concept of being in flow, right? The idea that you are doing things and with seemingly less effort, less thoughts, less, you know, of most of these things that we think we need to do more of. Very interesting chat with him about that. Also love his perspective and really respect it on how we can be learning as athletes and why we might not be learning the ways that we should, which are very common human ways to learn. And really interested in seeing who might go to his website, zerototodangerous.com, and check out that course. Uh, As you will see at the end of the episode, there's a discount code. You'll get 500 bucks off of that course if you decide to invest in yourself and your path to greatness, your path to the elite level, which I think is very wise. I think we spend so much money right on these things that really don't give us a ton in return, whether it's the coffees every day or the drinks or the the meals out or the entertainment in any shape or form. And just setting aside some money and saying, you know what, I'm going to invest this much money each year for what I'm making, whatever that is. And this percentage is always going to go to improving myself as an athlete, as a human, then costs for things like this, which seem so strange in the beginning, but actually are necessary, uh, are very wise. And they become much easier to, to say, okay, I'm giving up these things to get these things. This is short term. This is long term. It's worth it. Uh, without further ado, enjoy the show. Again, leave comments, reviews, share with one person, anything. But if you don't, and you just enjoy it. I'm happy. Hey there, Stephen. Welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm great. Good to be with you. Yeah, great to have you. So, I mean, I'm really excited about this personally and uh, through so many of my friends with USA Volleyball, a lot of other nations for volleyball, national team athletes, former guests, uh, speakers on the show. They've all been like, we need more psychology. <laughs> because it's so lacking in, in our world. Like, where are we gonna get this knowledge from? Everybody says things like, you know, get your mind right, uh, be strong, you know, um, focus on this and overcome these things, but they never give you any real know-how. And when I read your book for the first time, it was most interesting to me because A, I used to snowboard, used to mountain bike, I did mountain bike trials, I did BMXing, I skateboarding, 
I did everything that you could do that would be basically <laughs> scare the shit out of you so that you, you had to overcome it. I loved it. I lived from that. So when I first read your book, uh, I was honestly, I was in love with it because I realized, wow, that is so true because when I would get into the state of flow, it was always coming from these different things where basically I could boil it down to, for me, it was that knowing that I was going to fall off of this, you know, one foot long ledge that is eight feet or higher off the ground when I was just starting to me made me hyper focus in and like some of that and other things are in your book. So when I started listening to podcasts, actually how I came upon you the first time was Tim Ferriss. And then the second time was through Lewis Hounds. So I guess what I would like to do is just set up for people. What could their day look like in order to help themselves get into a state of flow more often? Um, and then also learning wise, I mean, you've done so much research and you put all these things together and listening to your other podcasts with, other, with these other guys, like I just mentioned, and there's one other that I just heard, but I can't remember who it was through. Um, learning for athletes, I think we always have to go a bit beyond what is the norm. We're usually just told things and then we try to implement them. And it's really hard for some athletes to seek that knowledge. So I guess those two things are the things I want to talk to or talk to you most about. Could you just get us started on what flow is and the story behind the book, The Rise of Superman, which is about decoding this? So um, let's just start at the beginning with a definition of flow and yeah. work our way down. Okay. So uh, scientists define flow as an optimal state of consciousness, one where we feel our best and we perform our best, right? And clearly, everybody listening to this podcast has some familiarity with this state, right? All those moments of kind of total increased focused attention on the right here, right now, where everything else just disappears. Your sense of self will vanish, time sort of disappears, right? The, the future vanishes, the past vanishes, you're right here, right now. Uh, and most aspects of performance go through the roof, right? Flow science itself is old. It dates back like 150 years to kind of the, the birth of, of kind of the experimental psychology, the birth of what became cognitive neuroscience, people were working on flow back then, and it's progressed a great deal. And you mentioned the psychology, um, and uh, it's, it's funny because the psychology, I don't think people need more psychology. I think you actually need less psychology, and here's what I mean. In the 70s, 80s, and 90s, what we knew about flow was the psychology, and we knew it a lot. Brilliant minds have worked on it, right? So we understood flow has its core characteristics. These, these elements always show up when we're in a flow state. Self vanishes, attention is focused in the right here, right now. Time dilates, which is a fancy way of saying it passes strangely. Our sense of control goes through the roof. It's an autotelic experience, which so it drives itself. It's incredibly motivating, et cetera, et cetera, right? And because it is definable, psychologists also figured out it's measurable. So we have like four or five really well-validated psychometric instruments for it. And, and they taught us some stuff about flow that was invaluable. What happened around 2000 is where a sort of my organization, the Flow Research Collective, myself, um, started to get involved, which is neuroscience started to accelerate exponentially. And we started to be able to peer under the hood of the flow and see where is it coming from? Why is it coming? And one of the things to emerge out of this work is exactly where you want to go, which is that flow states, first of all, have very precise neurobiological signatures. And what I mean by that is if you want to talk about the brain at all, you're really talking about four things. Neural anatomy and networks, which is a really fancy way of saying where in the brain is something taking place. And because things don't just happen in one place, they happen in a bunch of locations at once. You have neural anatomy, which is the exact area, and the network, which is all the actual parts working together. And then you have neurochemistry and neuroelectricity, which are just the two ways the brain talks to itself and the body, right? So you want to know all those four things. And then you want to know physiological things, heart rate variability, facial expressions, all that crap. We now know all that crap about flow. So when we say flow, we give this definition of this optimal state of consciousness, 
there's very, very precise neurobiology underneath it. And because of that, because we understand mechanism, we can work backwards to where the hell does this stuff come from and how do I get more of it? And what we've discovered, which is the actual answer to your question, is flow states have triggers, preconditions that lead to more flow. And the first thing to know is kind of the obvious. Flow can only show up when all of our attention is in the right here, right now. So that's what all these triggers do. There are 22 of them and they all drive attention into the current moment. If I were to say it more formally, more scientifically, I would say, hey, these triggers do one of two things. They either drive the neurochemicals, dopamine and norepinephrine into our brain. These are focusing chemicals. They're performance enhancing chemicals. They do a ton of stuff in the brain, but they primarily enhance focus, right? So when they're in our system, we pay a ton of attention to the right here, right now or the triggers lower cognitive load. All the crap you're trying to think about at once. You know, as an athlete, right, if, I, if you clean your room and your office and everything else is neat and know exactly where it's supposed to be so you don't have to think about it, it's easier to perform. While you're lowering cognitive load, you have more energy to pay attention to the thing you're doing. Right? Mm -hmm. That's what all these triggers do. So if you want more flow in your life, you have to sort of surround yourself with these triggers and you, to get to your second half of the first question, I think it was, yeah. um, what the hell was Rise of Superman about? And Rise of Superman was the story of what started to happen in action and adventure sports in the 90s, which is, as you know, as your listeners know, athletic performance is progression is fairly slow, right? It's governed by the laws of evolution and it just advances at a pretty steady, slow rate. At no point in history do we blow the socks off and start, you know, seeing doubling and tripling, quadrupling of athletic performance within the same year kind of thing. But that's exactly what started happening all over action sports um, everywhere. Surfing is a really classic example. From ninth, from surfing is a thousand year old sport. So a lot of history, a lot of time to get better at it. And from the fourth century AD to 1996, the biggest wave anybody had ever surfed was 25 feet. And they, they, there were physics papers written about, hey, it's impossible to surf a wave over 25 feet because of this, 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 and this, and this. Today, surfers are routinely pulling into waves that are about 100 feet tall, like it happens fairly frequently. This is exponential growth and ultimate human performance. Snowboarding, your old sport you were talking about. In 1992, um, the biggest gap jump, right, anybody ever cleared was the Baker Road Gap. It's in Mount Washington. And, uh, or excuse me, it's in Washington. Um, Mount Washington is in New Hampshire. Uh, it's in Washington. It was like 40 feet end to end. And that's huge. It's like two buses stacked, yeah. you know, right next to each other. Tra Travis Rice, seven years ago, I think, cleared a gap jump that was 270 feet, I believe, 264, I think. That's a skyscraper, right? In 16 years, we've gone from like double decker buses to a skyscraper. That's crazy. So, the question I asked in Rise of Superman, besides telling all these stories, is what the hell is going on? Why is this happening? And um, what we know is that these athletes, for a lot of different reasons, got fantastic starting in the 90s at harnessing flow. They started to build their lives around all of these flow triggers. And in doing so, they maximize the amount of flow in your life. Now, let's be clear. It's not just these athletes. Any place you go where you see extreme innovation, Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is a culture of innovation designed around flow triggers. If you go inside the most innovative companies in the world, the Googles of the world, right? What do you see? You see companies built around flow. When you go inside the kind of most nimble, agile organizations of the world, the Navy SEALs, an organization I've done a bit of work with, what do you see? You see an organization designed to maximize the amount of flow these warfighters are in. So it's everywhere you see extreme performance and extreme innovation. What we hadn't known up till now is what the hell we were doing, right? We didn't know there were 22 triggers. There are probably way more, but we've discovered 22. We didn't really know how they worked. We had these vague psychological ideas like you, like, you know, you mentioned a couple of them and okay, but like, most of the athletes I know, I will say, are pretty damn analytical, right? They want to know how it works, and then they want to see it work for them. And if those two things don't line up, they don't have time for it, right? Um, and, I, you know, I always say that the peak performers I know, and this is after, you know, 30 years of studying 
groups of people who have turned the impossible into possible, right? And and training, you know, well over a hundred thousand people at this point, from like the U.S. Navy SEALs through like Google and Morgan Stanley through uh, regular people. Um, you know, you, a you see for everybody, we are capable of so much more than we know when we drop into this state. Um, but it really seems to be the dividing line, you, as you pointed out these days, is mental, right? The physical fitness level at, 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 at the elite category is roughly the same. Every now and again, you get a LeBron James, a Shaquille O'Neal, right? Somebody where you're like, this body type doesn't even make sense. Okay, that's genetics. It's like secretariat having a heart three times larger than normal. Okay, nobody's going to win a race against that horse, right? Like, yeah. if that's just genetics. You're okay. So there's that, right? It's really going to be hard to beat the Kenyans in running because they've got different genes. Okay, we get this. Yeah. But what we do, what we're starting to get is that what we have massive control over is our brain, right? Is our mindset, is our ability to trigger these states of peak performance. And that seems to be all the difference. And I think it's all the difference, not just in athletics, um, where it's incredibly clear. And the other thing I want to point out, just since we're talking about it, is it's not just peak performance. This is really cool. Flow absolutely correlates with grit and persistence in any activity, but especially you see it a lot in sports. So I'll give you one simple example. Um, incoming high school freshmen, uh, there's a big study. I can't remember how many kids, but in the hundreds. Incoming high school freshmen, they measured uh, what their favorite secondary activity. So you played football, you played volleyball, you snowboarded, you sang in the choir, you played in the band, whatever it was. The amount of flow it produced as a freshman coming in was, was the best indicator of would you still be doing it as a senior and would you have started to achieve more, way more mastery, right? Would you have grown? Yeah. Flow was the core indicator of both grit and advanced performance on the back end of that, which is really interesting. That is super interesting, actually. I mean, this, uh, the idea behind the show really is about, you know, you mentioned most of the athletes you know, right, are highly analytical. They're seeking answers to these questions so that they can understand why does this lead to this so that I can do this. Otherwise, I'm not wasting my time in order to get to that place, right, as an elite level athlete, which I'm very grateful to have made it to that level at some point in my life. It took a lot of persistence. It took a lot of grit. It took a lot of time. It took a lot of failure. Um, there were a lot of states or, of being in flow, you know, for me, but a lot not at all. Uh, some of the things that you mentioned. I always tell people. Yeah. I always tell people on this front. So the thing I'm most proud of, and I mean, like, there's a lot in my resume you could be really, really proud of, I guess. The thing that matters the most to me is the first time I skied with professional athletes, I was 23. And I thought I was an expert skier. I went into that situation, I was in Chamonix, and I was like, I got this. I can, I, I got this. I've been doing this a while, I ski bumped it. I, then I got onto an actual mountain with actual professional skiers, and I was just like, holy crap. The distance between me and them is greater than the distance between me and an absolute never skied before beginner. Mm -hmm. That when I finally could keep up with the professional athletes, and I don't mean in Alaska, I mean we're in Jackson Hole or Squaw Valley, and we're all getting in the chairlift at the same time, and nobody's waiting yeah. for anybody. <laughs> 50 broken bones later, minimum, and 22 years later, I was oh, wow. 40. Five, I believe, the yeah. first time I like the, I took. <laughs> 22 years and 50 yeah. broken bones just to keep up. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, that's exactly what I was getting at. You know, it's, it's so important for athletes to understand that you're, you're going to get there. And, right, this is for, you know, there's, there's still at that level. Uh, I remember when I first got into pro volley and then just getting into pro volley and going from the, the bottom-ish level of that where you're really competitive, where you can get paid, things like that to getting to the Champions League level, right? This is like teams that are at an Olympic level at the top of that level. The, the just range there was insane. And knowing that a lot of friends are still in there somewhere, whether they played for years or not, it's always interesting to see that the people who were asking these questions and seeking the knowledge are the ones who may have gotten there more often. I have no stats on that, but that's what it feels like. I, so what, what I've seen in athletes, and this 
I will not hold at all in bat and ball sports, track and field sports, but in action sports, there's something that's very consistent um, that the athletes who have really long careers, right? Which to me is what the thing that you want. I don't care if you, you could switch sports, you could switch whatever, but you'll want a long, you want to, you know, be active and keep going. But they all seem to get physically hurt in a bad way in action sports in their mid to late 20s. 24 to 27, something snaps and it requires a lot of fixing. And on the other side of it, two things are clear. One, they're no longer as young as they used to and they realize that Kodak courage will only, like you can get really far in action sports with just bravery right? You can do it. Some you, have to, you need a lot of luck, but if you have a lot of luck and a lot of bravery, you can get significantly far until this happens. And what happens is most people just drop out at that point. They can never get it back. And the people who persist, men and women, are the people who figure out, oh, it's a mental game. And this is not about if I keep going big, if that's my strategy to outbig the next guy, somebody is always going to outbig me and my body is the sacrifice. This is not longevity. Right. And they have to, that's suddenly when the sport becomes psychological, it becomes, it becomes about more than just the physical fitness element of it and what can you do on the mountain or on, in the water kind of thing. And that's when you see most people drop out and then people become Danny Ways or Laird Hamilton's or yeah. right, the people, Jeremy Jones is right, the people I write about in Rise who reshape sport over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this is key, right, for a lot of athletes to take away because. When you persist and when you have that grit, when you say like, okay, I'm, this is not going to hold me back and there's got to be a better way. Every time there's some kind of hurdle or whatever, it always makes you reevaluate things if you're going to continue, right? And then you, you make this choice or you're reevaluating, you make the choice, you stop or you continue. When you do continue, I mean, you've reached another little level, right? You have this next level where you go, okay, what do I need to do to get better? And you keep talking about the mind and it's really important that the athletes we athletes remember that our mind really controls so much. I mean, there's so many times where it doesn't matter if it was one extra rep in the, the strength and conditioning or as one extra rep in volleyball or as one extra mental rep of whatever I was trying to train on. Whenever I get to the point where I'm like, wow, that's really hard. I finally made it. I've always tried to condition myself to go one, two, three more steps. And I surprise myself all the time. So I wonder what you think about that with that. So um, you, there's a, you said a lot in that small statement. So there's a lot of different stuff in there. Um, I'm going to talk about two things. Uh, I'm going to start pre-flow. So uh, at the Flow Research Collective, uh, we, we have a bunch of flow trainings, but we actually have a class called the Habit of Ferocity that starts. It's sort of what I call foundational peak performance. And... It's what I noticed is in training uh, pro athletes, Navy SEALs, spec, spec ops, those, those types of folks, um, martial artists, they all sort of did a bunch of things instinctively, automatically, that regular people did not do. And what I started to realize is that when you try to train up a lot of normal people in flow, they might get it. Like they can, the triggers work. Right? They work for everybody. They're just biology. Biology is scalable. I always say the problem in high performance is everybody wants to teach you what works for them. Right? If I was teaching people what works for me, I would be training people to ski through the trees alone at 40 miles an hour, blaring hip hop stoned. Because that's what worked for me. And that's helped, what helps me to write really well when I'm not doing that. Right? Yeah. That's obviously not scalable. That's obviously not what everybody wants to be doing. Personality doesn't scale. Biology scales, right? It's the very thing that evolution designed to scale. Um, so anybody can use these triggers to get more flow in your life. But, but flow is a massive acceleration. So what we know, what the data shows, um, just let's talk about cognitive high performance. Motivation and productivity jump some 500%. And we understand why that happens. Creativity, innovation um, jump depending on where you are in the state and what kind of work you're doing at the time, 400 to 700%. And we see the same thing. Learning rates accelerate. 
um, pro-social behavior, cooperative behavior, collaborative behavior, teamwork. So if you're playing a team sport, for example, all this stuff goes through the roof um, because the neurobiology is a big acceleration. But if you don't have certain things in place, you're just going to blow up. You're not going to be able to sustain it. What we discovered is that you need, um, and we have a class called Habit of Ferocity that sort of lays this out. You have to have all of your intrinsic motivation lined up. So curiosity has to become passion, has to become purpose, has to be executed with autonomy and mastery. You have to have proper goal setting technique on top of that. And then the, to, to part of your point, what we've discovered, and this is not what the science will tell you. If you talk to scientists, they'll say grit is sort of the intersection of passion and perseverance. This is a psychological definition. Mm -hmm. If you look under the hood, that doesn't actually make sense. Passion, passion is a motivator. It's a focusing mechanism. It's a flow trigger because it helps drive attention into the now, right? We pay more attention to the things we believe in. Perseverance, that's what we do when the motivation runs out, right? And it turns out if you talk to the peak performers, um, best of the best, they'll tell you that there are six kinds of grit that you actually have to be trained, or five kinds of grit. There are five kinds of motivation you need to stack and five kinds of grit you need to train at all times. Some of them, to skip back to your thing, is um, you got to train your weaknesses, right? Of course. And by the way, all these have to be trained independently. You can't. They don't overlap exactly. Um, there are a few workouts. Uh, I Mark Twight, who trains Navy SEALs and was one of the best rock climbers and, and ice climbers in the history of the world, uh, is on my board. And he's got a grit. He's got a kind of a workout training protocol that may train multi, multi, many of these at once, but it's the only thing I've ever seen that sort of does that consistently. But you hit on a couple of them, right? And you want to keep upping your challenge level. Just general persistence, for example, the easiest way to train general persistence is to do that extra rep, right? To, you know, okay, I normally do three sets of 10, I'm gonna do four sets of 12, because it screws my brain up and it's suddenly a lot harder. Twight does a lot of stuff where he will do really crazy supersets of like four or five exercises and the weights get harder. So you'll start at like 15 pounds and it feels freaking easy. And by the time you're done, it's 50 pounds and you've done like 110 reps and everything is bleeding and you've just, want to cry but you're training persistence right so it's really useful on the flip side so that's the foundational side right on the flip side of your question to the flow side uh the most important of flows triggers what often called the golden rule of flow is what's known as the challenge skills balance and this is the idea that we pay the most attention to the task at hand when the challenge of the task slightly exceeds our skill set so you want to stretch but not snap um, emotionally, it's sort of the midpoint, not the exact midpoint, but near the midpoint between boredom, not enough stimulation here, I can't pay attention, and anxiety, whoa, way too much, right? In between, there's this sweet spot, um, and it differs. Everybody's uh, challenge skills balance differs, and for example, a big part of it is psychological. So uh, in athletes, for example, and this is work done uh, by Susan Jackson and Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, um, they found that confidence can be 81% of what do we mean by challenge and skills. So just how much, right, how confident mm -hmm. masters much, much more than, than how much skill you actually bring to the equation. But I always say, uh, with the, what I liked about listening to you is you intuitively understand something that a lot of peak performers sort of miss, which is with peak performers, so we know that um, to really master this, the challenge should be just a couple of percentage points above your skills. Peak performers, man, we will bite off challenges that are like 50, 60, 70% greater than you know, our skill set just for the fucking fun of it, right? We do it all the time. And you can do, all of, you want to take on those big, giant challenges. I'm going to make it to the Olympics. I'm going to make it to the pros, whatever it is. As an athlete, for sure, for simple motivation purposes, this is goal setting theory, a high, hard goal. Um, I want to make it to the Olympics you will get an 11 to 25% boost in motivation simply by setting a high heart goal. We know that. The problem is you have to chunk it down so that what you do today is a tiny bit higher than what you tried yesterday because that's the sweet spot that maximizes flow, which also by extension maximizes motivation and learning. So if you stay in that sweet spot, and I'll give you, a, a, I'll, I'll, I'll drive this home in a second. If you stay in the sweet spot, you keep accelerating, you keep learning. And here's, um, I, we did some work a bunch of, a couple of summers ago 
and um, with uh, a bunch of uh, mountain bikers, semi-retired pro mountain bikers at Angel Fire in New Mexico. And we sort of raided everything on the hill because it's downhill mountain bike courses don't change. So you could go, oh, this is a 20 foot gap jump. And at your skill level, this is what you can do. You can jump 10 feet. So getting to this, well, that's way too big. But if you can jump 18 feet, getting to 20, oh, okay, that's a little smaller. So we did that. We mapped the entire hill. We mapped where people were. And we tried to keep them in the like, I'm going to push 3 to 5% harder today. And normally in action sports, and you probably remember this from your time as an action sport athlete, you'll see a bunch of flow early season because you're getting back up to speed. And you're like, holy crap. You know, there's all these stages where, as a skier, for example, there's a point where you're like, oh, wow, 30 miles an hour is really fast. And then the next day, it's, oh, wow, 40 is really fast. 30 was actually slow. And then 50 and 60, and you're actually finally up to speed. And you're like, oh, wow, yeah, this is actually the speed of skiing. And right, and as soon as you get back to the speed of skiing, ton of flow all over the place, right? And usually a lot of flow along the way. Then you tend to plateau, often for a bunch of the season. And then, because you're training up skills, right? You get this heightened performance at the beginning and your body is basically saying hey this is the next level of what you're capable of without flow you spend sort of the entire season learning those skills ironing them in learning to automatize everything flow did for you basically and then it all comes together and you get more flow at the back end and that's fairly common for most athletes right and i think some of the reason you get more flow at the back end is because you're like Holy crap, I made it through the whole season. I didn't get injured and anxiety starts to leave a little bit too, right? There's some of that. I think that helps. But anyways, this is a fairly common pattern. When we kept people in the challenge skills sweet spot consistently, which was really hard for a lot of athletes because they'd have big days and they'd want to go, they'd really want to push yeah. outside of it. And they'd have really weak days where they, and we just kept it, we just kept it a little, however you feel today, it's not even like what your yesterday best was. It's how do you feel today in terms of confidence and a whole bunch of other variables and what's like four or 5% harder than you did last, yeah. right? Like what's that? Don't try to beat the, your world records. Try to beat where you are today by four or 5%. And by doing this, we maximize flow. Nobody, everyone's getting into flow almost every time they were riding. Mm -hmm. And the progression over one summer was amazing. People really got a lot farther faster by dialing it back and just trying to go a little bit harder rather than crank it all the way up. And that's counterintuitive for most athletes, definitely for action sport athletes mm -hmm. who just think you're going to get better by going bigger, fast. You know what I mean? Like, oh, totally. um, right. You don't get it. The brain doesn't work that way. The body doesn't work that way. We don't learn well that way. Um, so, you know, what I always say, you know, biology is scalable and that most of what we mean by peak performance is just getting your biology to work for you and not against you. And biology, I'm meaning body and brain. So neurobiology, right? I'm talking about both. Um, I, that really seems to be the big differentiator, at least from what I can tell. Yeah, uh, there's something you just said in there and I didn't think of it in that way. Um, but I say a lot often to the female athletes that I work with through my business. Uh, but whatever day you're on, you have to try to give 100% of that day. But that day doesn't mean that that's your best. You're not at your best every single day. And the way you just said it is that, I mean, it's similar, but it's not. And it's very interesting well, because me... it makes it more manageable, right? Like if you're technically at 75% on that day and you give 100% of that 75 recognizing you're at 75, maybe if you just stretch it to that, you know, three, four, five percent more for certain things, you're going to get more out of that than trying to get up to the 100 percent and then further than that. The know? other thing that there's, there's a, I, you're, you're totally right. And I want to, yes, and I want to add one other component to that popped in my brain as you were talking, because I think this is key. And I don't think a lot of athletes totally understand this. When we're in flow, all the neurochemicals that show up, one of the things that they do is they deaden a lot of pain, right? They're mm -hmm. big painkillers. Strength goes up by like 15% in flow. And it's not really, state makes you stronger, makes fast twitch muscle response faster. These things speed up. But like most of that strike doesn't come from, oh, you're getting more strike. It's you're feeling less pain because I'm pumping you full of anandamide and endorphins. And these are natural painkillers. And I mean, when we say natural painkillers, 
there's like 20 different endorphins in the brain, but the most common one is 100 times more portoed than medical morphine. So these are heavy painkillers, right? Yes. So, and they're in your body and flow. Uh, and a lot of body awareness is dialed way down because the parts of the brain that make you aware of your body are shut down. Um, that said, the dream for me, the best day I have, for example, as a skier, which is kind of the sport I'm most serious about, is the day when I am absolutely miserable, but I man, it feels horrible and it hurts, but I do everything I did in flow out of flow, right? That's the day, because then I'm like, holy crap, I got it. Mm. I think I can do this now whenever, right? And you always see this on the way to any, you see this a lot in team sports, on the way to a championship, you often see a team have to win a game with nobody's in flow and everybody's in pain and they just have to do it without, right? And you need, like, that's a breakthrough game because then your brain is saying, okay, now we're ready to level up and that's usually what happens, right? You have one of those games, you always see it in basketball, super obvious in basketball. I've, I haven't watched enough volleyball to, to know if it was obvious in volleyball, I bet it's there too. But you always see, they almost get their ass kicked or they totally get their ass kicked, but they play really well out of sync and out like it's like they j yeah. you just grind through it it's it miserable it's the worst to rot when it happens in soccer in soccer you just feel for everybody when i see it happening i'm like oh or football um because it comes with contact anyways you know what i'm talking about yeah totally well i mean let's segue there into really just trying to help athletes kind of create or manufacture whatever some kind of plan for their days we talk a lot on the podcast mm. about uh Forming yeah, so let, let, things like that. I think so. It's funny. Uh, high, the first high performance philosopher was Nietzsche. Most people don't know this and have no idea that high performance, peak performance starts with Nietzsche, but it does. And the reason it does is because he's the first post Darwinian philosopher, psychologist, interested in a science based psychology. Um, and you know, post Darwin is like, holy crap, God isn't going to make me a peak performer. Biology is. And so everything changes. And Nietzsche basically, he doesn't, it's really funny because if you go back and study early thinkers on peak performance, especially cognitive peak performance, there is nothing that Nietzsche, Nietzsche and today's best coaches are literally saying the same thing, same blueprint, hasn't changed. Of course it hasn't. Mm -hmm. Biology is what scales and everybody's going back to the same Thing. You do a podcast. There are a million and a half peak performance coaches at doing podcasts. Now we're all mostly talking about the same thing. Why the biology is the same. Everybody's going to go in the same direction if they know what they're talking about, right? You have to. That's how it works. I have no idea how I got on this segment. Oh, yes, I do. What to do during the day. What to do during the day. So my point was Nietzsche, Nietzsche was like, but this is only available to 10% of the population. Like everybody, you can be the Ubermensch, Superman, yeah. right? But only 10% of people should try. Most people give it up. William James comes along and says, no, 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 no. Anybody can do this. You have two main levers to pull, attention and habits. And I wanted to, right, you mentioned habits. And I don't think that's changed. You have, for peak performance, is pristine habits. I always say, by the way, after this is after training, you know, tons of people and being around the best performers, you know, ever in pretty much every, any domain you can imagine. Excellence always looks the same under the hood. It looks like a checklist. People wake up, they got 10 things on their checklist to do during the day. They do them all fantastically. They have some kind of active recovery protocol at the back end. So don't just kick ass all day long and drink beer and watch TV. That's not going to work. Get a massage, do some stretching, get in the sauna, right? They have, they eat some good food. There's some level of social support because none of us are good alone, right? Wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, sister, whatever. They have some social support built in. They go to bed at the same time usually and they wake up and they do it again day after day, week after week, year after year for a career. That's what excellence looks like under the hood. It's, I mean, there's no other thing. The only thing about that checklist that is different in the people I've seen is that every item on that checklist is executed, surrounded by flow triggers. So for example, complete concentration is the m most important flow trigger, right? It's obvious. And so this is not for athletes per se, but this is when we're talking to everybody else in the world. 
What the research shows is to maximize flow, you need 90 to 120 minutes of uninterrupted concentration. And if you're doing something hard and creative, that can stretch up to like three or four hours sometimes. So the first, when I work with organizations, corporations, the first thing I do is I walk in and say, look, if you can't hang a sign in your door that says, fuck off, I'm flowing, you can't do this work. You cannot do this work. It, it, forget about it. Um, your biology will work against you and you can't do this work. So we need those periods of uninterrupted concentration to retranslate to ath athletics because the other thing that applies is always you want that period of uninterrupted concentration where you're doing your most important tasks, not your most urgent, right? So for athletes, this is training, right? This is practice. This is, right, this is what's most important. Um, and you want time luxury. Because you want to be able to put all your attention in the present moment, which is why you never want to train rushed, right? You also don't want to train when you're out of sync with your own biology, right? If you are a morning person, you want to be training first thing in the morning. If you don't wake up till the late at right, you want to map it onto your biology. My wife is a night owl. She's a writer too. Um, and she wakes up at four o'clock in the afternoon and starts going and she, her brain isn't really on fire till eight, nine, 10, 11 o'clock at night. I'm an extreme lark. I get up at three thirty, four 4 o'clock in the morning and I write from four o'clock in the morning till eight o'clock in the morning every day. That's when I do my best work. So that's like really the, the simplest place to start. We talked about the challenge skills balance. So you've got this stretch of uninterrupted concentration. What do you want to do with it? You want to work on your hardest task and you want to push a little bit harder than you did yesterday. This is not, I know this is rocket science, but you always want to do it, right? So this means, as we talked about earlier, you're, you're going to be uncomfortable because that sweet spot is outside your comfort zone just a little bit. But that means on a daily basis, right? You got to be a little outside your comfort zone. The story I always love to talk to, the story I uh, like to tell about this is, is sort of, she sent me high, who's the godfather of flow psychology and a Google mathematician once put a uh, number on the difference between the challenge and skills balance is like 4%. And that was the nut for meaning your challenge is 4% greater than your skill set. That was the number we sort of tested. They were, they were making it up basically. We just tried to test it with these action sport athletes and we found it was pretty close. It's not accurate. It's a metaphor, but um, I, I remember talking to Alex Honnold and we were talking about all this stuff and Alex is in Rise of uh, Superman and obviously he's the star of Free Solo, which won the Oscar this year. But we were talking about when he climbed Half Dome and he free soloed Half Dome in an hour and 22 minutes. Most people take a day and a half, right? He free soloed. It's the equivalent of a four minute mile and 37 seconds. It's right. And you ask Alex, how the hell did you do that? And he looked at me, he was like, yeah, you know, it's 4% plus 4% plus 4% day after day, <laughs> week after week, year after year. And I was like, yeah, okay, I get it. Fair point, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but like, literally, that's one of the most impossible. I, I don't know of an athletic feat that's more kind of astounding than what Alex has. I, I don't, I was a rock climber for a decade. It's an incredibly, it's, it's vertical chest with every muscle. Right. And incredible consequences. It's mm -hmm. a, it's a really heavy sport um, and a hard sport and the fitness level is insane. Anyways. Yeah. <laughs> but I th like I, you may, I mean, we don't have time to go through all 18 triggers. Um, the flow research collect. I mean, first of all, you can go to the flow research collective.com and there's all kinds of information about that. If you want more, there's, we've got trainings. Zero to dangerous is our, is our introduction to flow hacking. And we break down all of flows 22 triggers and how to use them so um that's available there's a lot of free stuff available to you but that's really what we see we see people executing the checklist surrounded by flow pushing harder right there's and the checklist you know you talked about it earlier what else is a flow trigger well risk is a flow trigger emotional risk psychological risk physical risk right that's what you were talking about snowboarding right Novelty is a flow trigger, complexity, unpredictability. And so let me give you just a weird example. So uh, you execute better in flow. And so uh, I was talking to uh, a very, uh, I'll not name them because uh, he's asked me to sort of not, but uh, one of the best high school football coaches in Texas. And he wanted his players to be in flow before they got on the field to start practicing because his thinking, and this actually has borne out, though I don't, 
we haven't done actual studies on it and we need to, but he, 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 his feeling was if I can get my players into flow before they start contact practicing, because flow is peak performance, maybe injuries will go down. They'll learn more. We'll get peak performance, but may it's the injuries that I want to see if they, I can lower. And he was like, well, how the hell do I get people into flow ahead of time? And I said, well, you're having them run before practice, aren't they? They're running, everybody's running on average two miles, right? Just at their own right to warm up, right? I mean, every football coach in the freaking world has been doing that since the 40s, right? So like, you're doing some version of that, right? Like whatever it is, like, yeah, hi, yeah, uh-huh. And I was like, all right, here. Novelty collection and unpredictability are flow triggers. Have them run in the woods. Have them turn the woods into an obstacle course. You see a tree, you dart left. You, 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 and for the big guys, it's just got to be really simple, right? You got 300 pound guys, they don't have to do what you want your running backs to do and blah, blah, blah. Just novelty, complexity, and unpredictability, and a little bit of risk. So run downhill, for example, if you're running through the woods. And don't go crazy, just do it a little bit and run a little like slower than normal a little bit because we know there's something called exercise induced transient hypofrontality, which means the prefrontal cortex deactivates the front edge of a flow state and it happens automatically after about 20, 25 minutes. That's why you always need warm up runs or warm up sessions. You want to get that going. So you want to sort of stretch your warm out up, up to the point it gets a little quiet upstairs. Usually, most people feel up. Uh, their breathing opens up and that's nitric oxide, which as we move into flow, there's a global release of nitric oxide is a gas a signaling molecule. You breathe more. So you're suddenly you're like, Oh wow, my oxygen exchange is better. It's quieter upstairs and I feel a little less pain. Now you're at the edge of a flow state. Now it's time to go practice. And we did that. I've been doing that with a couple of different teams. What they see is injuries go down, practice goes up, retention goes up mm -hmm. and you're just, you know, using your biology to work for you um, in a really sim sort of simple way. I don't know if any of that answered your question, but I hope it was useful. It was. It was. It did answer the question because we don't want, you know, a step by step because the, it can't be the same day for everybody. Right. But for knowing sure. that there are the triggers, knowing that there is the checklist, knowing that you have to repeat things to become great at them. It's, these kind of things is what we're trying to get towards. Right. And OK, then. So. Flow Research Collective, uh, just a little bit on that. What is it? Why did you start it? And we're going to have the link in the show notes. Also, we'll have the link on um, the YouTube video and all that jazz. So athletes who are interested, they can go check that out, sign up for that. Tell us more. The, uh, the Flow Research Collective, it, a collective is a group of people who have come together for a single purpose, right? That's what we're doing here. And the Flow Research Collective is a bunch of people, and I am by say bunch, what I mean is that um, obviously we work with the, the general public, but uh, on the research side, we work with organizations like Deloitte, Formula One. We work with institutions like UCLA, USC, Imperial College London. So um, the people who have come together to decode the neurobiology of flow, you know, the, our motto is decode flow, recode humans. Mm -hmm. And we're a research and training organization. And um, I mentioned the training side earlier. We work with everybody, you know, from businesses to spec ops to the general public. And on the research side, you know, I just sort of listed, we do. And we're, you know, we are hardcore devoted to devoting, uh, just decoding flow, which is sort of where we're starting. And uh, then we're building uh, the world's first kind of biophysical based flow detector. Right now we have psychological questionnaires. We want, we actually want an AI that can tell whether or not you're in flow or out of flow based on a bunch of different physiological signals. Um, and we actually want to use that to build uh, peak performance virtual learning environments for everything from kind of, I, the most important thing to me is, is retraining workers in America because we're heading towards some technological unemployment with AI and robotics and being able to, re jobs are everywhere, right? Jobs, we, we have a shortage of workers in this country. Right. What we have is a transformation of the workforce in America, in the, in the globe. And we need what we need to be able to do really fast is retrain people from one skill set to the other. And you can do that in VR distributed in a high flow environment. So it's accelerated learning. VR is really good at producing flow. So we've got a, this is, you know, that's our goal. That's what we're doing at the Flow Research Collective. Um, and uh, it's super fun. <laughs> Loving yeah. it. I love that. I mean, we're 
my goal right now with uh, with Beyond Athletics specifically is something similar, but using part of what you're talking about and saying like athletes, let's uh, let's look at learning, let's look at how we become greater and greater at our sport or sports, right? Um, and let's apply those lessons to our lives, to our work, to our passions, to everything, so that right when we want to recode, when we want to pivot because xyz happens million things can happen right in life whether you choose to or not i think that's yeah so let, me, let me speak to that for half a second yeah, because so. you i think you're saying a little more than you know and this is really true so flow is essentially a focusing skill i mean it's the most complicated focusing skill we know of right because of all the shit going on in the brain um, or not going on in the brain as the case may be um, but it's essentially a skill it's trainable and what we know is like any other skill, the more flow you get, the more flow you get. So for example, and heightened creativity, uh, Teresa Mobley at Harvard, this is not my work, this is her work, discovered that the heightened flow, the heightened creativity and innovation you get in a flow state will outlast the flow state by a day, maybe two. So you can get into a flow state playing volleyball, running, skiing, right? And then you go back to work the next day, whatever it is that you're doing, you're carrying that heightened creativity into your work life, one. And two, by training the brain to focus that way on the court, on the field, on the hill, you're training your brain to focus that way in the classroom, in your office, right? These skills, we, we lateralize these skills. Um, and I, the other thing is athletes don't know, they don't get that. Nobody tells athletes, hey guys, you have a ton of invisible skills, right? Skills that are Shane McConkey, greatest skier of all time. I do this in Rise. What he was better at is seeing lines. He could look at a mountain and see a wave from top to bottom that other people would look at and go, it's absolutely impossible. And he would look at it and go, oh no, I think it's totally doable. You just link that with that with that and you've gone and do it. It's an invisible skill. Like what the hell is that from the outside? But what that allowed him to do as a skier, when he took it into ski building, ski design, he invented fat skis. People always ask me, because I do all this work on disruptive technology, what's your favorite piece of technology, Steven? What app do you like? And I'm like, my favorite piece of technology is my fat skis. Are you kidding me? Thank you, Shane McConkie. And that creativity came from creativity of looking at problems in different ways on the mountain, right, in flow, oh, now I can look at problems a different way when I'm being an innovator in, you know, as a, designing new skis. I mean, he revolutionized the sport. And skiing was a dying sport at that point. Snowboarding was everywhere, and he revitalized it um, yeah. with that one invention. And don't think that isn't because of flow, right? There's transference. So what the skills that you, the kind of skills you have as an athlete, every place else in the world, oh, my God, it's an incredible advantage. <laughs> don't let me tell you different. So it's so applicable or applicable everywhere. And I, I, I want athletes, that's like my main goal, Stephen, is just to help athletes understand that you can apply these things, these invisible things that we, we know, we're just not even aware sometimes, most times, that we know these things or that we could apply them here, here, and here. So I do love that. I can't wait for that to come out more about, especially the, the learning and the modules and what you want to do. Um, let's just really quick get into the last little section here. Talk about uh, for athletes, we, we already kind of hinted on this a bunch or spoke about it directly, but learning, I think it's really important that we as athletes uh, look at it as you, you work on what you would say peak performance training, right? This is like your yeah. world. It doesn't mean like you're a peak performer, performing athlete. It's just human, right? Yeah, no, I mean, I always tell people uh, my world is the art of impossible. Right, wherever you see paradigm shifting, nothing is ever the same again. Breakthroughs, that's where I work. That's my interest, right? And that could be in sport, that could be in business, that could be, you know, exactly. in solving environmental challenges. It yeah. doesn't matter. Uh, like when, whenever the impossible becomes possible, I want to know how did that happen and how can we do more of that? Exactly. And that is what I wanted to segue into. Like, what are some of your tips? Like, how do you go about learning about these things where you go, like, this is interesting, this is important? How do I look at other people or find these resources? Where do you go to do that? How do you go about that? And I mean, how could that relate to an athlete thinking outside the box instead of letting people just give information in, seeking that out, like what you've seen from elite level athletes? So 
if I've seen elite level athletes make one consistent mistake over and over and over and over again, is they don't read books. Mm. Swear to God. Like it's so unbelievable. Somewhere along the line, people started telling athletes, hey, it's about body and not brain for you, right? Which first of all, as we've been talking about for the past 45 minutes, not true at all. This is very much about brain. And the point I'm trying to make is what your brain does at a fundamental level is pattern recognition, linking ideas together, right? And so I always tell people one of the, there's a bunch of high flow reasons for this, but I always tell people try to read 25 to 50 pages a day in a book. And there's specific reasons you want to read books. Um, it had, comes with information density that we're not going to talk about here, but books are the best, most condensed form of information available on the planet and better than podcasts, better than uh, speeches, be all, better than visuals. Um, books are really condensed knowledge. Um, and you want to read outside your discipline, right? If read as like follow your curiosity out your brain is literally built to automatically make connections it's going to take that new information it's going to make connections this is flow priming because novelty is a is a flow so you're going to start getting into cognitive flow a little bit more by doing this um but literally the answer to your questions like you need to constantly be feeding yourself information and not just outside your discipline. You want, you, you want it outside your discipline, not just in your discipline. And honest to God, I think that's the biggest mistake I, I, I see among athletes is they're not reading enough. They're not feeding their brains because somebody's convinced them that they're in a body business. You're, you wouldn't be in the business without the body stuff. Your body is what got you into it's, it. It's the reason you're there, right? But your brain is what's going to actually turn it from a hobby into a career, into a, right? Like that's, and you got to be feeding that. Um, so. That's literally, I, I mean, I know what you're saying. And I feel like as an athlete. I see a bunch of my friend's books there, by the way. Which one? <laughs> uh, those are a bunch of people, different people I know. Uh, Daniel Kahneman's book, Sticky Fast and Slow, is awesome. Yes. Um, Yes, that's that's like the the one I'm starting that one now. I'm I'm finishing. All right, so so let me and... so let me yeah let me let me let me add on to it because you by the time I'm done with this, this stack, um, you'll have a lot of fun. Start with Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, okay. then read a book called Strangers to Ourselves, which is a re that. and then read a book called uh, The User Illusion. And by the time you're done, the User Illusion, The User Illusion. Yeah, this is okay. the like this uh, I, those three books. Whenever people think they have control over their consciousness and their cognition, yeah. I'm like, no, no, no. You <laughs> read these three books in a row, you're gonna walk away going, oh wow, I'm a lot less in control than I thought. Yeah. Well, it's funny because a little a little tidbit of that came from reading uh, what was it, influence, and then the power of habit, like just talking about these automations and all these other things. But that's a whole nother level. I'm I. Definitely, we'll do that. Yeah. All right. I, Power Habits, a great book. Charles yeah. Tudor. I don't. I wish you would have put it in context. I like. I. Mm. I don't think. Yeah. I, I. 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 Habits are our most. They're our greatest ally, right? Pristine habits are our greatest ally. Um. And uh. I. He makes it seem like it's all hard. The great thing about yeah. habits is like. The, you get the hard part for free. I always say that with like peak performance with that uninterrupted section of concentration, this could be an athlete. You know, this isn't, this is an athlete at the front end of a training session. You hit the gym. This is me sitting down to write. It's only hard for the first 12 seconds. And then you're, then you're doing your thing. Right. <laughs> and then if you're good at your thing, you're actually in flow and you're enjoying it. So like the thing that you're trying to avoid it's fucking 12 seconds long. And then you're going to probably have a couple of lapses during the course of that, right? So what are you talking about? You're talking about like 35 seconds of uncomfortable is really what all that resistance about. Yeah. That's crazy. I think it's right? a, a, one of my little models, sorry to interrupt, is uh, always just start. Whatever it is that I'm thinking about, uh, I want to do it or I'd like to do it or that could be interesting to do, just start, just try it. Because if it's like working out or like volleyball for me, I mean, the moment, even if I don't want to go, once I get in it, mm -hmm. I'm like, man, I'm going to do a light workout today because I don't really want to do a heavy workout. Even though I need that heavy workout, the moment I start working out, oh, it's on. Yeah, you can lie, you, you lie to yourself to get in there. Yeah. I, do that all the, I do that all the time. Oh, I'm just going to, you know, I'm just going to ski 
10 laps today, yeah. you know, whatever, just to like, I, I'm just going to get my legs moving. That's all I'm going to yeah, do is, yeah. right? Like, but no, I totally agree. Nietzsche, I said, I mentioned earlier that Nietzsche was the first high performance philosopher. And apropos of what you said, one of my favorite Nietzsche quotes is nothing is more expensive than a start. Mm. Right. And he's, and, and what, but what's really, he's right. But what's really funny about that is you're really only talking about, right? That 10, yeah, 20. Okay. I mean, as a weightlifter, for example, in the gym, at what point in exercise one do you go from exertion to, oh, I'm just doing my thing, right? Like it's somewhere by the sixth rep or something like that, you're already in it. Mm -hmm. It's fast. It's always fast. It's the days where it takes me, 20 minutes to get into a workout are rare. Usually it's within a couple of minutes. I'm like, oh, this is what I'm doing. Cool. Yeah. I, I can't even think of all of that. Or actually, I probably could remember a day that was, it took me that long to get into a workout because it's so rare. I don't, I don't think I've ever had, had one. You know, it's always, you start yeah, and then no, you I mean, get that, going. And by the way, that's, all the, that's another thing. This is another thing I, I think athletes get and uh, non-athletes don't quite understand is that you're always going to be uncomfortable, but it's actually, it's microseconds. In fact, one of the things we know from flow, flow is a cycle and on the front end is a struggle phase and it's an, it's an overload and it, uh, you can, it happens at every time scale. And even in, so in, even in microseconds where people move into flow really quickly, there's always a moment of maximum uncomfortability and resistance mm -hmm. that they have to push through to it and it, it you need it you need, it's a nor it's a spike of norepinephrine and a couple other neurochemicals that absolutely drive attention into the present moment and it seems like you have to meet it with testosterone like this uncomfortability shows up and if you don't immediately get aggressive lean in immediately you mm -hmm. can't get into flow but if you train that like ah that, right that's what the seals mean by embrace the suck right the minute that that awful shows up if you instinct, I call it this the habit of ferocity, which is the first course I, um, at the Flow Research Collective, that the ability to automatically, instinctively lean into any challenge. Mm -hmm. And you want, that's what you really ultimately want to automatize. You want to automatize the lean in, the rise to instinct, so that when you get uncomfortable, you match that, you automatically match that with aggression. Now, sometimes, by the way, there are situations where you want to retreat. Right. I'm not mm -hmm. talking about those. But as a general rule, you want to go through the hard thing before you've realized you're going through the hard thing. Because if you stop and think about it, fear and anxiety and resistance, all that shit's gonna get in the way. But if you can automatize that thing, right? The habit of ferocity, those 12 seconds go away. Mm -hmm. I love that. Actually, when you're talking about fear, it just made me think of uh, Kristen Ulmer because she's uh, one of the next guests I wanted to get on. She talks about fear. But anyways, all right. Let's, uh, let's talk really a good quick. friend. Tell her. Yeah. Tell Kristen I say hello. I she's will. She's a lovely, lovely woman. I will, for sure. Um, let's just wrap up with the last couple of things. We've already gone through. I wanted to ask you about you know, some books and some things like that. We got all of that. So uh, let's just tell people how they can follow you, what you're, what you're doing right now, what they should be checking out, more so than what we've already given them. Yeah, so um, what's new? Uh, I, I, my, uh, I've got a new novel out, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to know what the future looks like, it's based on you know, 25 years of looking at both human capability and disruptive technology. So, um, and it just, uh, over the weekend, it, became an, an, it, was number, it hit number one on Amazon in the sci-fi category, so I was psyched about that. Mm -hmm. um, and I've got two books coming out in the next six months. Um, one in November called Mapping Cloud Nine, that is about neuroscience and flow and the upper possibility space of human experience. So a lot of sort of what we've been talking about, but the historical views, I, I call it, but it's really like Nietzsche to now, right? It's peak performance from Nietzsche to now, um, where it starts and where it's going. But really, if you want to hook up with me, flowresearchcollective.com, stephencotler.com also, um, there's tons of fun, free stuff on both those sites to go as deep or as shallow as you want. <laughs> what's the the book that's currently out or coming out called last tango in cyberspace last oh michael gervais i heard that on that show oh yeah yeah, yeah. Michael's, like, michael uh, michael's on by the way michael's on the board at the flow research collective and we've teamed up with michael and uh in the usc center for uh 
uh, performance science, and we're doing a multi-year investigation of flow and creativity. Wow. We're, we're, we've, we've completed the first pilot study, and we're, we're, we're moving on to our second one. Um, to really trying to isolate what flow triggers correlate most with creativity. And um, obviously, creativity is kind of critical skill for the 21st century, but also um, in athletics, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I always say football is the, is the least creative game anybody can think of for seven seconds. And then it's the most creative game in the world for three, right? Mm -hmm. Do exactly your job for seven seconds and then improv like mad for three. And the, yeah. it's like three seconds of innovation. Um, so even in the most, you know, in those performances, I, I think creativity matters for athletes. So anyways, we're, that's what we're doing together. He's a great guy too. Fantastic. So, and then just for listeners to remember, if you want to go check out some more zero to dangerous.com head over there. Oh uh, yeah. Zero to dangerous is the name of our main training. Head over to zero to dangerous.com. Sorry. Definitely. Forgot, I, to, oh, forgot to mention that one. You, you had already, by the way, some, at some point you definitely did, cool. but uh, I will be going to check that out. What is, this is the last question I've got for you before we say goodbye. Um, title of the show is beyond athletic, the thinking I get, I think you've got what, what I'm going for, for you, how would you define being athletic more than athletic being beyond athletic? Jesus. Um, I don't, I, you know, it's funny. I think I answered that question with my book comment, right? I, I, like I, what really bothers me about athletics is how much it's a mental game and how much uh, people have convinced athletes they're involved in a, in a in, I mean, physicality is obviously a part of it. And um, that's part of the, the joy there, right? Is the physicality, but th these are mental games. And um, so to me, Beyond, I don't, I don't know what be beyond athletic means, but I do know that there's a stereotype of what it means to be, to be athletic. And if you're not training your brain and your body at the same time, you're just losing. As far as I can tell, you're not going to win um, in life, in sport, in in anything. As far as I can tell. All right. Well, thank you I so get much for the being face. on. No, no. Hey, my pleasure, man. And uh, all the best. We'll have to check out everything. Everybody go to that site. Check this out on YouTube. If you do go to that, go ahead over to beyondathletic.com and you'll hear everything there. Thanks so much, Stephen. Thanks, Rob. Be good. All right, you too. There you have a great episode with Stephen Kotler. Make sure you head over to zerodangerous.com. Use that discount code Beyond Athletic to get 500 bucks off of that course if you choose to do it. Like he mentioned, there's tons of resources for free on both of those sites. I really enjoyed this episode because it really helped me see that there, you know, a different perspective on things. Also, understand a little bit more of why and how he wrote that book, what went into it, his actual personal life experiences, also. And it's just really fun to, to chat with somebody who's dived so deep into a topic and not just skimming the surface on something that we need to know a lot more about as athletes, which is how to control our emotions, our thoughts, our actions, all of these things, how they play a role. And this whole concept with the 22 triggers and all that stuff is, is just, I love it. When I read that book, I'm telling you, I instantly was like, this is the coolest thing ever. Yeah, part of that is because the extreme sports and the athletes, but I really understood that because being an athlete that comes from that type of background, learning about what he was talking about, where I think he called it like a Polaroid or a whatever, basically doing those tricks or those big things just to get the attention uh, because they were so risky rather than using your brain and really trying to tap into things and grow and being wiser about decisions so that you could have a longer career a more successful career things like that love that hope you enjoyed it if you did as always share it post it Send a link to somebody. You can find us on Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher if you're using a non-Apple phone. Also, you can find us on YouTube now. This is the second episode that we're releasing so far. I do have some older ones that I hope I get some time to kind of throw them online on YouTube. They won't be as fancy and whatever, but they'll be there. So until next time, be more. What we do in
life. Echoes in eternity. I'm going to show you how great I am. And this concludes our Chicago show. Please stay tuned.